Um, oh, oh. It's, the, um, it's an embedded database engine. It's found in a lot of products like your web browser, uh, Microsoft Excel, QuickBooks, iTunes, Skype, uh, Lightroom. It's also found in a lot of gadgets. It's, it's running your smartphone, it's running, uh, you're probably running your, your, your set-top box for your cable television, um, your camcorder, game consoles, and this sort of thing. It's a small embedded database. And like uh, Postgres, it's open source, and so I don't really know how many versions are out there running. But if you count up the number of smartphones and the number of copies of Firefox and so forth and so on, we think that maybe there's about two billion instances of SQLite running at any particular moment, and about 500,000 different applications that code to use SQLite. It's a huge user base. I did not really set out to to do that, but it kind of worked out. And so you may be asking right off, well, what does this have to do with um, Postgres? I came to a Postgres conference, not an SQLite conference. Well, it turns out that SQLite is sort of a spin-off of Postgres. Uh, I call it maybe a conceptual fork. SQLite doesn't have any Postgres code in it. But the way SQLite came about was I was working on a project and we were using Postgres uh, as a development database and um, we, we actually needed an embedded database and, and I, I used the Postgres documentation as my guide for writing SQLite. And you can kind of tell that because as far as I know, there's only two database engines in the world that have a vacuum command and they are Postgres and SQLite. <laughs> but it wasn't, you know, but Postgres, we, uh, SQLite really depends on Postgres for more than just that initial development. We continue to really look up to Postgres as our mentor. Um, uh, we, you know, there's it's, it's this thing about SQL and the SQ, if you ever tried to read the SQL standards and try and understand what they mean, um, you might as well be reading ancient Sanskrit. I mean, it's just incomprehensible. And so apparently here at Postgres, you have some really, really bright people who can understand that stuff and, under, and, and, and interpret it for mere mortals. And, but nobody on the SQLite team can do that. So we, we really look to, S, to Postgres as our, our model for what to do correctly. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so, you know, every now and then uh, with SQLite, something will come up. Somebody will have some obscure query and they'll say, well, SQLite's getting the wrong answer here. And it'll be sort of an ambiguous case and everybody's scratching their heads. And we'll think, well, what, what is the right thing to do, actually? And our standard thing to ask is, what would Postgres do? <laughs> And uh, so we go out, and, and if Postgres gets the same answer as SQLite, then the issue is settled, and then just have to assume that, um, that that's the right thing to do. But, you know, we also look to Postgres when we're adding new features. Just this past January, we, in SQLite, uh, we added um, common table expressions. And so the first thing we did when, when we were tasked to do this by one of our customers was to go to Postgres and see what they did to implement it. Now we went beyond that. We implemented some things that Postgres doesn't do. I mean, we, 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 we allow an order by clause on, the, uh, on a recursive table expression so that you can um, uh, select either um, a depth first versus breadth first search. And, and the algorithm, we started out using exactly the, the Postgres algorithm as in the documentation, but we found one that gives exactly the same answer that's a little bit faster that we ended up using. But still, this is, this is Postgres is what we go to first. Another reason we look to Postgres is our past experience. About, um, oh, this is five or six years ago, we were doing a new test suite for SQLite called SQL Logic Test, and you can read about it at that website up at the top. And the idea was that we have about seven million different queries that we run through five different database engines, SQLite, MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres. And in the course of doing this, we learned a lot of things. Um, uh, we learned that the MySQL syntax is not really compatible with anybody else. And we, but we also, at some point or another, we managed to segfault every single database engine 
except for Postgres. <laughs> Postgres always worked, always gave us the correct answer. Now, just yesterday, somebody was telling me, well, that's just because you were not running 9.3. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But, but for whatever, we always, and, 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 and really, out, outside of the Postgres community, Postgres really does have this reputation for being rock solid and always giving you the right answer. It's not just us, it's everywhere. So that's why we use Postgres all the time. So, but there are some differences between Postgres and SQLite. Um, at the top of the list, I mean, Postgres is really designed as your enterprise data depot. And you're all Postgres people, so I'm assuming you understand what I mean by that. But SQLite really wants to be an application file format. And you might not really have a clear concept. On what, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what it means to be an application file format. You know, whenever you've got a new uber cool app, um, and you do file open or file save or whatever, the stuff gets written onto the disks in some form or another. And this might be XML, JSON, YAML, comma separated values, some kind of binary format. Typically, the, the common thing to do for, for one-off applications is um, it's not a single file, but you create a directory hierarchy full of files and put all your stuff there. And that's the file format for the application. And what we like to argue is that SQLite makes a much better file format so that when you do file save or file load, instead of writing a bunch of files, a, a, writing a pile of files, it's opening and using an SQLite database. And there's a lot of advantages to this. Uh, for one, if you use SQLite, you don't have any um, parsing or code parsing and writing logic to debug and, and so forth. I mean, you, you might write something and it seems to work really good, but then when your, your, your application file exceeds two gigabytes and, and, and the, an offset pointer no longer fits in a signed 32-bit integer, it might suddenly fail. We've already debugged all that stuff for you in SQLite. Um, you get single file documents. You preserve the document metaphor. And your file, you can easily attach it to an email and send it to somebody. You get a high-level query language automatically. This greatly simplifies your development. The content is accessible. If, you, if you've got an application file format and it's a pile of files and some of them are in strange formats, um, it, data lives longer than code. And long after your application has ceased to exist, somebody might still need to access that data. And if it's in a weird pile of files format, they're going to have trouble with that. If it's in an SQL format, they're more likely to be able to access it long term. SQLite is cross-platform and cross-language. By that, I mean you can take an SQLite database file, move it off of a big Indian 32-bit machine, move it over to a little Indian 64-bit machine, and it works fine in either place. It, it, there's no byte order dependencies, there's no word size dependencies. It's completely cross-platform, so it's, it's a universal file. And this is really cool when you're writing an application and you want to store an integer someplace. You don't have to worry about byte order and that sort of thing. Also cross language because a lot of, uh, this, this comes a, a lot in like research environments where you have different teams that are doing different parts of some process and this team over here wants to write in Python and this, this group over here is in C sharp and this group's in C++ and that group over there is in Fortran 4. And, but if, if SQLite is your application file format, they can all interoperate easily. You get atomic transactions, incremental and continuous updating. You don't have to write, rewrite the entire file just to change a few bytes. It's easily extensible. If you, if, you know, people always de they develop an application file format and they don't plan well for extending it because it never, your first cut is never sufficient. But if you've got an SQL database there, you just add a new table or add new columns to the existing tables and you can extend the format very easily. It's multi-process and multi-thread safe. You don't have to worry about two instances of the application messing with the database file at the same time. And you can get improved performance. So here's an example of a major application that uses SQLite as its file format. Uh, MicroStation is a CAD CAM system that's probably used to design, say, the waterworks in the city that you live in and that sort of thing. It's a big multinational company and all of and, and so they've got a, this CAD system and whenever you design something with MicroStation and you do file save it writes it out as an SQLite database 
And then they have all these accessory programs that do things like water hammer and seismic analysis and all these other an analysis things for your design. And they're written by different teams, possibly in different programming languages. But because it's in a, a, a database, um, it's really easy for them to interoperate. And also, uh, SQLite has um, the, uh, it's got an R tree query engine, which they use to, to quickly figure out some subset of the database to use for viewing like that. Uh, another example of using SQLite as an application file format is Adobe's um, Photoshop Lightroom, uh, which stores all of its information in SQLite. The Adobe team was uh, an early adopter of SQLite for this purpose, and they were the first ones to discover that it's actually faster to store blobs in the database than it is to store them as separate files in the file system, up to a, up to a particular size. They, they had the question of, well, should we store all our thumbnails in the database, or should we just put the file name in the database and then store the thumbnails separately? Turns out, uh, we did some measurements, and turns out that for thumbnails of less than about 100K, it's faster to read and write them from the database than it is to read them and write them from the, from, the, from the disk. We don't know why, probably because of the open and close overhead, but they were the first to discover this, and it surprised me because when I was designing SQLite, I never intended it to store really big blobs like this. I didn't realize it would work that well. And the blobs, you know, they have to be broken up into individual pages to fit into the database file. And I didn't do anything to make that efficient. There, it's just a linked list of pages. And so to, to access a, a one kilobyte uh, thumbnail, it's got to, you know, read, it's got to follow a linked list of 100 1K pages to, to get all of the data, but that's actually faster than opening the file and reading it off of disk. So some other things have not used SQLite, and I wanted to play some what ifs here to talk about you know, how things could have been better. So consider the open office document. Uh, this presentation is done in NeoOffice, and so it uses the open office document. And an open office document is, or an open office presentation, for example, is really just a zip archive with some XML files and images. And uh, to be fair to Open Document, uh, Open Document existed long before SQLite, so this is not you know a deficiency that they didn't think to do this. This is just an example. You know, I don't. Anybody here use Open Office, or do you use actually um, a, a proprietary presentation software that works better? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes. yes. Okay, you use both. Um, you know, Open Office is great. I love it. I use it for everything, but. It has some annoying features. Um, one is that when you open it up, you get this little progress bar that has to spin across because it has to read and parse the entire file in order for it to display anything. If it were a database, it could just query for the first screen and, and bring it up right away. Um, saving. Open Office has this annoying thing that you, you'll be entering information and it'll suddenly decide it wants to make a backup of itself and it freezes up the screen and then this little progress bar goes across and that can take 10 seconds or more for a big presentation on a slow machine and it just locks up while it's doing this backup and the reason it does backups is because it crashes a lot and it don't want to lose all your work but um, you notice it has to write the entire file in order to make a backup whereas if you had a database you only have to write those particular changes that you were doing um, uh, if you ever shut down OpenOffice, LibreOffice, NeoOffice by turning your computer off, and the next time you bring it up, it wants to go through a recovery process. It brings up a dialog box, and you have to click on some things. Very annoying. If you use an SQLite database, the recovery is automatic. There's never a need to file save. There's, it, it, just, it, it can save as you type. And you can have undo that moves across sessions. So you're working. And of course, you can undo, unlimited depth undo while you've got it open, but then you shut down, move the presentation to a different machine. With a database, you could rig things with triggers so that you could undo back into your previous sessions. And you could do lots of things like a large searchable database of index files. I, um, I like to read books on my Nook in the EPUB format. I don't know if you use an e-reader or not. But there again, you know, EPUB is another one of these pile of files formats. It's a zip archive of XML files. And I was thinking, you know, if that was SQLite, you could just, you know, you'd have all these, you, you, it would open faster. You could have full text search. One of the, I love the Nook 
But one annoying thing about it is, is the search is useless. It's essentially grep. It takes forever. But we could have full text search with the complete Google syntax um, uh, if, if they had done it as a database file. Now, you might be asking, what? You know, here, here's I, just as an example, I wrote this little utility called an SQLite archiver, which is the idea of um, taking a pile of files and moving it into a database. And this, the entire schema is, is shown there. We've got the name of the file, its access permissions, last modification time, its size, and then the data is a big blob. And, and you, you could vary this according to what you wanted. And uh, there, I've got a URL here at the bottom that, where you can go and download the source code if you wanted to look at it. It's just a demo. It's not a real product. But uh, you could use something like this as a replacement for your zip archive if you were doing a pile of files format. And, and you'd gain transactional support and random access. And then once you've done that, then you could start adding other tables and gradually transition into using an SQL basis for your application file. And I, I did this, and you say, well, probably a database is going to be a lot bigger than a zip archive. Not really. Um, this presentation is pgcon2014.odp. It's in the open document format. I unzipped it and then recompressed it with this SQLite archiver tool. And you can see it grew in size by half of a percent. So a database file can be as storage efficient as a um, zip archive. So one, one, fast, one, one last example, bear with me. Uh, everybody here uses Git, right? Or you at least know what it is. You know, Git's the configuration management tool, and it uses a pile of files format. It's got the Git directory, and it's got a bunch of files under there, and that's its application format. Well, what if that were a database instead, an SQL database of some sort, where you'd have advanced queries that you could use for a much richer, richer user interface? Uh, and I've got some examples of that later on. It would be proof against crashes right now. If you're committing something and, and you lose power, you get weird things in, in your Git file. You could easily add tickets and, or trouble tickets and bug reports and wiki to your archive. That'd be simple if you had a database th to drive it. You could get concurrent access. Uh, multiple scripts could be using the same repository at the same time. Um, coding errors would be less likely to corrupt the repository because um, what you could do is when you're making changes to the repository, you could, you could do it all inside a transaction. And just before you commit, you go back through and make sure that everything is still accessible and everything is still right before you issue your commit. And if anything's wrong, then back it out, roll it back. On the fly repository compression, uh, right now you have to do git pack. I guess it does git pack automatically every few commits or something. But you could do that on the fly. And, and, but, but, but really, you'd end up with a single file repository, a document. And you could just you could, uh, attach your git repository to an email and send it to a, a, a collaborator. Alas, they didn't do that. So anyway, those are kind of, that's kind of the difference here between Postgres and SQLite is Postgres is geared toward an enterprise data depot, whereas SQLite is geared more toward a file format. And all of these other differences between the two systems flow out of that automatically. So with, with Postgres, it's going to be client server because you need a server to manage your enterprise. Is that a question? I just want to point out, we don't actually have to dump and restore any longer. No, you don't have to, but you are free to. I mean, don't get ahead of me. Don't get ahead of me. Um, so, uh, yeah, you've got client server where SQLite wants to be serverless. It, 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 it's writing directly to the disk. There's no server to get involved because this is part of a small application. Uh, Postgres is striving to scale up. You want to store ever more data on ever more places. And it, uh, whereas SQLite wants to scale down because it has to fit on ever smaller devices. Um, and with Postgres, the, the, the database files are in some secret directory known only to your database administrator. I don't know where they are. They're somewhere on my computer. I'm not really sure where. Uh, with SQLite, it's a single disk file, and it's well-named. You can call it whatever you want, because that's what we're trying to preserve the document metaphor. Now, dump and restore, uh, you, you have the option to dump and restore in Postgres. So if you wanted to change your file format, you can do that. And then when people upgrade to the next version, maybe you found a better way to do things. Uh, you, could, you could say, well, this, you know, to do this upgrade to Postgres 10, you've got to do a dump and restore, which is fine. With SQLite, we've got 
billions and billions of database files in the wild, and we have to be able to support that going backwards. There are some things that I would have done differently looking back, bottom line. But I can't fix it now because I've got this massive legacy base that I have to continue to support. And finally, with Postgres, you really have to have an installer because you've got all sorts of binaries that are going all over the place. Whereas SQL is a single file of ANCC that you link into your application. So those are the differences. And the key point of this is that SQLite is not a competitor with Postgres. SQLite is competing with FOpen. Okay? It's a complementary to Postgres. These two work in tandem with each other. Uh, there are other differences, and this is worth going over. Uh, in Postgres, you can create a table with an integer column, and then you can insert into that column a string that looks like an integer. And it will automatically do the conversion from string to integer and store an integer. And SQLite does exactly that same thing. And, or you can have a column that is text, and you can do an insert into that column that is an integer, and Postgres will convert that integer into a, its text representation and store the text. And SQLite will do exactly the same thing. But down here on the bottom, I've got a column which is of type integer, and I'm storing a string in there that does not look like an integer. And Postgres will give you an error message if you try to do that. SQLite is happy to store the string. See, the thing with SQLite is that the column types are a suggestion, not a requirement. So um, it tries to put things in the column type that you've specified, but it doesn't insist upon it. There's no data loss. I mean, the entire string is, is still there. Nothing is lost in conversion, but it just doesn't insist on converting things. So in SQLite, because the data type is just a suggestion, it can be completely omitted. You can create tables with columns that have no type specified whatsoever, and then it will just store whatever data type you happen to put there. Um, now, Postgres has this data type called any, but it doesn't work on columns. And I can, I can speculate on why that is, and, and there are probably technical reasons for that, but let me just put forward to you that that's actually a very useful thing to have in some cases, the ability to store any data type in a particular column. I've seen some of my clients uh, where they do schemas and they've got, uh, they've got some table where they need to store three or four different types of data, and they'll have a separate column for each data type, and then another column that says which data type this row is in. And so of the, three, of the four data columns, only one will be filled in and the other three will be nulls, and they just use one of the four for each row. And you can do that, but it would be so much more convenient to be able to just have a column where you can store whatever you want. Just say it. Um, Postgres does have a text type, and hooray for that. Congratulations, I love that. Well, not, a, not every SQL database engine does that. You know, something that really bugs me is that um, people are still using varchar and putting a, a fixed length on their text fields. And I don't real. this is, you know, having a, a, a fixed length text, fee, text field makes sense in 1975, but we're, this is 2014. Why are we still doing that? What, has, have we not realized that, that, you know, arbitrary length buffers are good? Postgres does that. It allows them to, um, it allows a text field to be a primary key. You can't do that in every other enterprise database engine. Um, Congratulations. But you know, one thing that I do find lacking in Postgres is that you don't have a blob type. By day. You have by day, yes, you could substitute by day there, but then you also don't, you can't do the blob literals with the X followed by the string that contains hex, which I might be mistaken because, you know, the standards are kind of written in Sanskrit, but I think that's a standard, isn't it? Is it not? All right, fix it next week. All right, so this is, this is something, I'm claiming this is a, 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 a rare deficiency in Postgres, and I just wanted to bring it to your attention. How do you do blob literals in Postgres? Well, I mean, you do a byte A, and then you can use, well, you can use. Use some weird Postgres-specific yeah. stuff. Yeah, okay. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> 
Okay, so there are differences between Postgres and SQL, but they're united by this SQL language, and that's really the point of all of this. This is what, this is what brings us all together. SQL is the secret sauce that we really should pay attention to. When, when I hear people think, talking about database engines, a lot of the talk is about um, uh, the storage engine, replication, uh, and this sort of thing, and, and all that's very important. Don't, don't get me wrong, it's all very important, but really it's, it's the SQL that is the spice that really makes this happen. This is what really sets Postgres apart from a lot of other offerings out there, is the SQL. And, and you need to think of SQL not as a query language, but as a programming language. Each statement is a separate program. When you prepare a query, that's like compiling it. And, and but it's, it's, it's an, SQL is an odd language in that it's declarative. You're telling it what to do, not how to do it. And it takes new users a while to really get into that. And you can recognize a new, somebody that's new to SQL is that they just do queries uh, that return a single row based on the primary key and they do a bunch of this and then they process it inside their application rather than doing a single query that does all the processing for them. They really haven't gotten this whole declarative query type thing into their head. The other really cool thing about SQL is that the relational data model really works well for representing a lot of things in the application domain. It works much better than a lot of other things that are in common use. And representation is the essence of computer programming. That quote comes from Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Month. Everybody familiar with The Mythical Man Month? Who has not read The Mythical Man Month? You should go buy that and read that tomorrow. But anyway, Fred says, um, show me your flowcharts and conceal your tables and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables and I usually won't need your flowcharts, they'll be obvious. The, he's trying to make the point that, that it's the data that really matters. Uh, now, this is, um, you can tell by the use of the word flowcharts in this quote that this was written a long time ago. When he wrote this, flowcharts were state of the art in programming technology, okay? So we've come a long way since then, but this, this, this timeless truth remains essentially the same. Here is uh, Rob Pike saying essentially the same thing more recently. He says, data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, the algorithms will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. This is essentially saying the same thing. It's, the, it's, the, it's your scheme of design that matters. And then here's... Um, Linda Storval is saying on the Git mailing list of all places, bad programmers worry about the code, good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships, which is very true. Very ironic then that Git should use a pile of files data structure. But <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, the point is, uh, you know, these key value, eventually consistent data stores, I really, they, 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 they're not going to stand the test of time. I really do not believe that. I mean, they, you, you know, I, know I, I get the idea of key value and eventually consistent is that sometimes you just got to have that for scale and for performance. And there are a few problems that really do demand that. But it's, it's, it doesn't have that timelessness about it that something like SQL does. SQL is built to last and it's going to be around for a long time. Uh, you know, I didn't call them no SQL databases because I hate that term. I prefer the term postmodern database because I don't know if you're familiar with postmodernism and the absence of objective truth. When when you query when you when you when you query one of these postmodern databases, you don't get back a fact, you get back an opinion. You know, and depending on your application, sometimes that might be okay. But you just, but you don't want to do this for absolutely everything you do. You really, a lot of times you really need to know facts. Um, I like to draw a comparison uh, between, to the art world. Um, I mean, you, you have before you two priceless works of art. Uh, the Da Vinci and the Picasso here. But one of them is closer to reality. It, is it realistic? Whereas the other one is abstract and 
It's not real. And call me old-fashioned, but I kind of refer, I, I kind of prefer reality when I'm doing my work. So, anyway, uh, a couple years ago, I, I ran across uh, this talk by um, Alexander Lloyd. He's from Google. He was talking about this uh, uh, new SQL uh, thing that's internal to Google called Spanner. Uh, I don't know a lot about Spanner. In fact, I'm not sure anybody outside of Go Google knows much about Spanner. The published reports are kind of sketchy. But apparently, Spanner is a, a global scale transactional ACID SQL database engine. And he, in his talk, he said, there's been, a, an, there's been a big cultural shift at Google. The SQL-based analytics system, Dremel, made a lot of SQL converts in Google. People realized that uh, the incredible power of being able to push the semantics of your query over to the storage engine and just let the storage engine figure out what to do. And he also notes that no SQL databases that only have weak consistency are enforcing a broadly applied premature optimization on the entire system. So, but I wanted to focus on this, this idea of pushing the semantics of the query into the storage engine and letting the storage engine figure out what to do. That's kind of important because every one of us has a finite number of brain cycles that we're allowed to use. And if you can spend those brain cycles messing and worrying about how you're going to do your queries, or you could spend them actually providing value to your customers. You kind of have that choice. And of course, you have to spend some time thinking about how to do your queries, but the less time you spend thinking about your queries, the more time you'll be able to spend thinking about adding value. Here's an example. Uh, I use every browser that's made, but uh, Firefox is, is probably my favorite. And it has this thing called an awesome bar where you start typing things in up there on the URL bar, and it then gives you a lot of choices of things that might match that. And um, uh, every time you press a key in the awesome bar in Firefox, that query runs. And it pulls a lot of information from a lot of different sources. You can see there's six different sub-queries. There's a union all. There's an order by. There's a limit that went off the bottom of the screen, I think. And you don't really have to understand the query, that's not the point. My point is this query is replacing probably several thousand lines of C++. Much easier to write, much faster to write, much easier to debug, much easier to tweak if you want to improve performance or if you want to change the behavior slightly. Here's um, another example, and you'll notice here I'm using Chrome. Um, I took the Git repository for Postgres. I did this Saturday, so this is not up to date. Um, it, it, I, I'm assuming somebody's checked in something since Saturday. Raise your hand if you've checked in something to the Git repository since Saturday. Okay, there you go. So, so this is out of date, but um, I asked, uh, I loaded it into a different um, configuration management system, and I'm not trying to, I, and, and I did that because this other configuration management system uh, is backed by SQL rather than as a pile of files. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to push you to change. That's, that's not the point of this. The point is this, I wanted to show you what you can do if you have an SQL uh, backing rather than a pile of files. And I just asked it to show me all of the check-ins for Postgres around the same time that I made the first check-in to SQLite, which was on May 28th of 2000. And as you can see, uh, it appears that uh, Bruce was making some changes to vacuum at about that time. And, what's, and of course you could do this in, you could do this in Git, but you'd have to, with Git, it would have to scan through thousands, tens of thousands of check-ins going back to trace the history to find this point in time. Whereas because this is in an SQL database, we have indices, this was computed in five milliseconds on a machine that is a 124th slice, it's a virtual machine that's a 124th slice of a real machine, and it's also hosting several other uh, uh, major websites at the same time. It took five milliseconds. And then once you have the data in, oh, here's the query, by the way. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a join with two subqueries. It's not all that complicated. I didn't put it up here for you. You're not expected to know what this means. The point is that this is replacing hundreds, thousands of lines of code that would be found in GitLab. Uh, here's another query against that same database where we're looking at the number of check-ins by user. Uh, and so we can see as of the weekend, Tom is in the lead, Bruce is a close second, and Peter, whom I do not know, is a distant third. 
I was told, somebody explained to me that um, uh, probably this isn't realistic because this is just recording the ID of the person who did the commit and apparently a lot of, a lot of users just send in patches and then Bruce will push them in for them. But anyway, this is, um, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of reports like this that you might find useful. Could you do this in Git? Oh, sure you can. In fact, I think GitHub does something like this. Uh, but, how, but how would you do that in Git? And, and when I ask that question, probably a lot of the heads in here are starting to think, well, I could start pulling data here and that and the other. No, you're not getting it. That's not the point. You shouldn't have to think about how to get the data. The way you do this, the way you generate this report is select count star comma username from check-in, group by, group by two, order by one decreasing, and then format it. Let the database engine figure out what to do. Every now and then you have to give it some hints to you know, performance crit critical query, but you know, 97% of the time it's just going to do the right thing and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, that data, by the way, is available online if you'd like to look at it. Um, I, it's, it's just a snapshot of the Git repository. It's not kept up to date, so I will take it down after a few weeks. So if you're watching this on YouTube a month later, it might not be there anymore, but it's there right now. Uh, some final concluding thoughts. Uh, you really need to think about Postgres for its SQL. That's the, really the secret sauce. It's a programming language, not a data storage engine. And that's the key thing. That's what makes Postgres so great is the SQL. Postgres is also the best available reference platform for SQL out there right now. And let me encourage you in the strongest possible words not to let that change. We really like Postgres as a reference platform. And then finally, while well, you're writing your Postgres applications and you're typing along and you're writing in some code and you start to type F open or whatever the equivalent is in your programming language of choice, stop and think, would SQLite be at a better use? Would, would SQLite work better in this context so that you could carry the SQL forward into um, that part of your application as well? I uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this talk. That is the conclusion of my keynote. I'd be happy to answer questions if there are any. Yes, sir. And I will repeat. When, when, when you uh, will consider actually adding constraints and, and being able to do data type validation. All right, the question is, when, would we consider adding constraints and do data type validation? Uh, that's a common request. You can, if you really want to force a particular column in SQLite to be um, of a particular data type, you can put a check constraint there and say, you know, okay. check type of whatever. Um, there, people have requested maybe a different mode you could put it in where it really does enforce the types. Right. Uh, but I've been kind of reluctant to put that in. I, you know, I, I didn't mention earlier, and people talk, people compare the two. They're saying that that Postgres is strongly typed and SQLite is weakly typed. I hate that terminology. That's wrong. It's Postgres is rigidly typed, and SQLite is flexibly typed. <laughs> or you could say Postgres is um, um, uh, uh, legalistically typed, and SQLite is typed with forgiving and loving kindness. <laughs> so, um, pardon me? Hippie typed. There you go. <laughs> My last name is Hip, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Boos or hisses? Thank you very much for paying attention.